In 1896, there's a case of Plessy versus Ferguson where the court says it's okay to have separate accommodations, but they have to be equal. And that was in a railroad case. And over the next 50 years, uh, states and localities had separate but ostensibly equal accommodations of all kinds, public accommodations, schools. And the NAACP had been trying for a number of years before Brown to actually get the accommodations to be equal, because in most places they weren't. They were separate and unequal. And what Brown does for the first time is really say separate can never be equal that there are intangible harms to separation when it is imposed by the state against a minority group as an intentional harm, as an intentional way of saying you are inferior, you do not belong, uh, you are unequal, and we will treat you unequally. And in Brown versus Board of Education, the court said in no uncertain terms, that is not okay. It's not okay for states to separate people on the basis of race. Uh, because it inherently brands them as inferior and inherently creates inequalities, even if the schools were equal, even if everyone had brand new school buses, brand new books, brand new school facilities, there would still be a harm based on the fact that the state was separating people. And the case occurs in education, in the education context, uh, and the court actually makes a lot of the fact that this is in the education context and that that's part of the harm is, number one, that these are children uh, who are learning important psychological lessons and internalizing this inferiority, uh, and number two, that education is the place where we train citizens. Education is the place where people grow up and learn, uh, and so education is incredibly important. At the same time, I think most people didn't think that this would be limited to education, even though the court said it's going to be limited to education. It was a really big, important principle to say that separate can never be equal. And they say it in the context of the schools in Brown, uh, but it clearly seems to apply elsewhere as well. So when the court decided Brown, it said explicitly that it was not going to deal with the problem of the remedy. It was establishing a new principle, the principle that separate was not equal under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, but it did not state what the states and localities and school boards now had to do in order to fix this constitutional problem. And they thought this was a really big issue, and they needed to know more about it before they could say anything. So they ordered re-argument, uh, and the various sides re-argued to the court. They submitted briefs. They held oral argument. The Solicitor General of the United States weighed in. And they uh, issued another decision in 1955, which has now come to be called Brown II, and the first decision come to be called Brown I. And in Brown II, you can really see the justices trying to figure out how much they are going to require the states to do how quickly. And uh, the backstory is that each justice is really struggling on his own and with his clerks and with each other to try to figure out what this intervention into politics is going to look like. Uh, that they are they are very aware that they're not speaking into a vacuum. They're speaking into powerful views on both sides. Uh, they're speaking to a relatively newly assertive civil rights movement in the South, as well as resistance on the part of many white Southerners. And they're trying to figure out how they can create a remedy in Brown too that will cause the least resistance from whites and get the most desegregation in the least amount of time. Where they end up is uh, talking about, in va rather vague language, a prompt and reasonable start, moving with all deliberate speed, and, uh, and not creating what the NAACP wanted, which were specific deadlines for when desegregation had to happen. On the other hand, when you read the opinion and think about what the implications are, the reason that the court is not willing to establish particular guidelines and particular deadlines is because the court suggests that what 
the white Southerners and what the Southern states have to do in order to remedy Brown versus Board of Education is huge. They need to redistrict. They need to move children around. They need to reorganize their schools. I mean, the court is thinking about this as a major overhaul of the Southern education system. They're not thinking, strike the laws from your books and you're done. And then whatever segregation still exists, still exists. That's not the way they're thinking about it. They're thinking there are going to be major logistical obstacles because what has to happen is major logistical change. The Prettyman papers show an incredible wealth of debate and dialogue among the justices as they're trying to figure out these answer, the answers to these very hard questions. And one of the things that it shows is all of the information that the justices had in front of them. They were interested not just in the principle of desegregation, they were looking at how school boards worked and how districts were created, and not just schools, they were looking at housing patterns, they were looking at housing segregation, they were trying to figure out if you just get rid of the laws, do the do, do you end up with desegregated schools? And the answer was often no, right? Um, because of housing patterns, they were really thinking about the logistics and the politics. And you can see them in conversation with one another, in memos with one another. They create an, an immense report that's in the Prettyman papers about um, uh, what the logistics will look like. Uh, they have all kinds of data, and so what you can see is all of the options that are on the table. And then you can watch how the justices going about, go about winnowing out those options and figuring out which options are the ones that they're going to take. And so it gives you a sense, you know, we tend to just read Supreme Court opinions. Um, and one thing that the Prettyman papers do is demystify that opinion and those opinions uh, and show you that, in fact, there wasn't always one view. And the one view hides so much more about what the justices understood, what they were thinking. And you can read the opinion in a whole new light once you see what their clerks were telling them, what they were talking about each other with, and what information was in front of them.